Coming up on Market to Market, HPAI makes the leap to dairy cattle in humans. An eventful first week of April weather-wise across much of the U.S. The conditions leading to the spread of wild hogs. And commodity market analysis with Christy Van On Cheeseth next. What's next doesn't happen by chance. It happens when researchers and farmers work together to solve tomorrow's agronomic challenges. We're committed to creating what's next. Because a pioneer, our name is our mission. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, April 5th edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. Sometimes it only takes one, a single Federal Reserve Bank governor hinted Thursday on holding off on rate cuts, which sent the stock market sharply lower. Then came Friday. The job market continued down the expansion path, adding more than 300,000 jobs in March, well above expectations. The growth in positions pushed the unemployment rate down to 3.8 percent. March was the 26th consecutive month that unemployment has remained below 4 percent, the longest streak since the 1960s. New jobless claims climbed to a nine-week high of 221,000, which is still very low historically. The early days of a crisis are often driven by rumor, hearsay, and conjecture. This week's announcement of the confirmation of H5N1 avian flu in a Texas dairy herd followed this same path. A webinar held by the National Milk Producers Federation on Monday drew over a thousand attendees searching for information and possible solutions. But answers may be slow to develop as researchers study the outbreak. Peter Tubbs reports on the evolving situation. Analysis of H5N1 avian flu samples have confirmed the infection has passed from birds to dairy cattle for the first time. The H5N1 avian flu infection has spread to herds in multiple states as a result of shipping animals between farms. Well, the, the landscape in the dairy sector has changed. There are now a number of farms in multiple states that uh, have had high, highly pathogenic avian influenza diagnosed in one or more cows. Before those diagnostics came out, we did not consider that dairy cattle could become infected with highly pathogenic avian influenza. The reported cases of H5N1 in dairy cattle are believed to be the first occurrence globally. The Center for Disease Control has also confirmed the infection of at least one farm worker who had close contact with infected animals. Symptoms in cattle are reduced feed intake and dramatically lowered milk production, changes in manure consistency, and general fatigue. Infected animals appear to recover in seven to 10 days. A few dairy cattle have stopped milk production after recovery, but it is unknown if the condition is temporary or permanent. Rather than the respiratory distress symptoms in birds and poultry, H5N1 appears to cause an illness similar to mastitis in roughly 10% of an affected herd. There have been no observed deaths of dairy cattle as a result of H5N1. Dairy producers are encouraged to segregate animals with symptoms of H5N1 and to quarantine animals new to the farm for a month. The H5N1 virus has been observed in raw milk from infected animals, but the virus does not survive pasteurization. Any milk from infected animals is destroyed. A lot of this is, falls back on biosecurity, and so you know, we're still learning about the routes of transmission. Um, so biosecurity is important. So you know, when you have people that are coming onto the farm, wash your boots coming in, wash your boots going out, the milk truck drivers going to multiple farms, we want them to not be part of, the, part of a potential spread as well. Experts hope a cautious, methodical approach to the response to the outbreak will be the best plan in the long term. This is probably not going to go away in a couple of days. But that's why I think we need to make sure we're taking these measured approaches. 
and not overstepping into areas where we just don't have the information yet. In related news, the nation's largest egg producer closed a plant in Texas after H5N1 avian flu was found in its supply chain. Cow Maine Foods announced that nearly two million poultry were destroyed at an egg facility in West Texas. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. The drought monitor reflected an increase in weekend moisture with a nearly one point improvement this week. Then came Tuesday. That's the monitor's data cutoff. And when a major storm complex roared across much of the Mississippi River area to the east, John Torpy has our weather wrap. The early April storm was no joke across much of the eastern United States. As every state east of I-35 had some type of weather report generated this week. The biggest system was a nor'easter, which barreled up the coast, slamming Boston with high winds and rain, generating intense waves along the shoreline. Further north in Maine, snowblowers returned for the spring show of winter. Downed power lines in New Hampshire were widespread. More than 700,000 homes and businesses were without power in the Northeast. Between five to six inches of heavy, wet snow fell in Madison, Wisconsin, and continued into upper Michigan. Presumed tornadoes tore through much of the South. Just outside of Atlanta in Conyers, Georgia, heavy roof damage was visible from the air along with large debris fields. Other parts of Oklahoma, West Virginia, and Ohio also had damage. The weekly preset map was a dark green color from eastern Iowa to the Atlantic, delaying spring field work and hampering grain movement efforts. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. Wild hogs have been found in several U.S. states, and the damage can be severe. The animals that date back to DeSoto need some water, will eat almost anything from bugs, pecans, or young wildlife. The population is exploding. Aaron Sumrall is in charge of outreach, education, and research for Pig Brig, a company that makes a live trap. As part of the MTOM podcast, we discuss non-native exotic animal feral swine in this week's cover story. It is. Uh, it's something that, again, too, I think that, that whenever we start trying to put our thumb on really when it got bad uh, for where I was at was in the probably the early 80s. Um, up until that point, I mean, in, in, in a lot of the rural parts of the South, I mean, all over the United States in those rural parts, there was still a lot of folks that, that use that livestock species, even though it was an exotic wild spe species, they depended on it as a protein source and uh, and, and heavily uh, manage that population just for that. And then you start to look at the, the mid eighties, the early eighties, things like that. The economy shifted a little bit. Uh, there was more people that weren't coming back to the farm after, after they graduated high school or college or whatever the case may be. And as that generation of people aged out to the point where they couldn't go out in the, in the woods and the, the brambles, the briar patches and look for these pigs, we took the, we took the, the, the foot off the, the, the management gas pedal for a pig and reproduction didn't stop. I mean, they, so they just exploded in population, and uh, and now we've got the 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 bomb that what we have, um, and, and quickly moving to wherever, basically wherever they want to go. You mentioned the the population explosion, the lack of uh, population control, hunting uh, for those things. It's it wasn't like a policy change that you no longer can do this, therefore this thing grows. This was just nature taking off right because the pig i mean a wild pig that what we have in the states is considered a non-native exotic so with that there's no game laws that really govern that that animal as far as hunting seasons anything like that so basically for all practical purposes where the where the hooves of that animal stand whatever property that the, those feet are at that's who owns that exotic animal if they move from my property to yours, now they're your your issue. They're your exotic animal. There's no ownership. So there's really not a lot of legislation that was in place that would hinder a lot of the management. But early on, yeah, early on, we it was it was managed heavily uh, with firearm, um, and and there were just a lot of people on the landscape with firearms that were looking for that protein source. And in the last 
30, 40, 45 years or so, there's been a substantial decrease in the number of people that are out there on that landscape. And it's got to the point where it's not subsistence hunting to look for that protein source. It's hobby or recreational hunting. And we know just through libraries of, of research that there's no way that we're going to shoot our way out of a pig problem. So it's going to have to be something of an adaptive strategy uh, integrated at a, at a specific time based on, based on a prescription for each individual property. We took, the, we took the foot off the gas pedal of the, the management on that species, and it's just unbelievably, I mean, it's, there, there are a fascinating species, and I don't say that with, with uh, a, a passionate thought in my mind as far as good. They are fascinating in the fact that they are unbelievably reproductively efficient. They are adaptive to any situation that you put them in, and they're un this extraordinarily intelligent. So they they're the basically the the bomb, if you wanted to say, of an exotic species that can occupy anything that you anywhere you put them. This thing can adapt, and absolutely. And when and when you saying the out migration off the farm, so basically eyes and ears of people uh, that you know this boar, I'm gonna take care of this thing tonight. When there's no right. one to see that. It just one becomes two becomes four. It's compound interest of problems. Very quickly. Yes, very, very quickly. And and now we're seeing it too. And you look at the at land ownership trends across the country. Everyone likes the opportunity to own land. There's just unbelievable benefits there of owning your own land. And and one of the things that what we see that was in that expansion of pig populations across the country is that the the number one limiting factor for pigs is water. Whenever you look at the, the, those harsh environments, pigs can go into those areas and flip over enough rocks to find enough grubs and beetles and bugs and so forth and so on just to exist until they wait for those, those, those plentiful resource times of the year and they'll, they'll crank out a litter of pigs in a very short period of time. So that fragmentation is a big issue. So not only uh, can they reproduce quickly, they'll eat anything can operate on right. minimal water. Uh, so, yes, a lake, a river, uh, a watering tank provides a right. problem. Um, we know they're detrimental to crops. Are they detrimental to other livestock? You mentioned the cow that uh, might be between two sources. What's the, what's the nature battle there? Well, when we start looking at native wildlife populations, it's pretty catastrophic because, I mean, any, anywhere you go around the world, if it's an if it's a native population there, there are other native species there to control that 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 number. What I mean is basically that you've got the coyotes here to control rabbits. You've got the or, or excessive deer numbers or so forth and so on. There's no natural predator for the pig. So basically, whenever we get to the point where pigs have weaned and in 35, 40 pounds, there is not a, a natural predator that we have that's native to North America that's going to uh, see that pig as a food source to the capacities of reducing numbers. It's just not going to happen. So the, in the, the challenges then that pigs pose on existing wildlife is that we know, and again, too, going back to just libraries of research out there that shows that, that pigs are just unbelievably catastrophic on ground nesting birds like quail and turkeys. Uh, you can decimate a population of those bird species in a very short period of time. Their life expectancy or life range is not that long, and it doesn't take very many egg clutches to be lost before you devastate that population. The full MTOM is available now. Next, the Market to Market Report. Flat export demand kept the lid on grains and sideways trading as last week's report is in the rear view. For the week, the nearby wheat contract added seven cents and the May corn contract lost eight cents. Despite good demand for meal, fuzzy signs from China kept beans neutral. The May soybean contract lost seven cents while May meal fell 460 per ton. May cotton shrank by 514 per hundredweight. Over the dairy parlor, May class three milk futures fell 29 cents. The livestock market was mixed. June cattle dropped 820. May feeders cut 1052. And the May lean hog contract found 505. In the currency markets, U.S. dollar index lost 17 ticks. May crude oil added $4.03 per barrel. Comex gold rose $103.60 per ounce. 
And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index was up nearly 27 points to settle at 599.90. Joining us now is regular market analyst Christy Van on Jesus. Hey, how you doing? Good, how are you? You know, I wish we had big reports to talk about, but in a way we kind of do. Right. When you look back at last week's report, did the market digest them quicker than you anticipated or did they just shrug their shoulders and we just made a whole big to-do at about nothing last week? Yeah, so I thought you were going to actually extend off of corn. You know, corn got some friendly numbers out of that report, and so I thought you would extend it off, and then we got into this week, and there was just enough other news that I think the market was like, oh, we'll deal with this later type of a thing. It's always that we look forward to something, and then yeah. it's digested and we move on. So when you when you look at wheat, we're, we're kind of dealing with some of the same scenarios. We're always dealing with Russia. We don't know what Europe's going to happen. We're dealing with dry conditions. But we did have some U.S. news develop this week, and we also had – the different markets were trading in different directions. As a generality, where's wheat headed right now? Yeah, I think that's probably one of the aspects I'm most friendly about out of this wheat was wheat. And the fact is that you were able to close higher. And it's just, it felt like it has been a struggle fest for this market to get up and get going. I think there's enough dynamics happening around the world that you're starting to see this buying come back in. And the old saying is if you really want to see a bull rally, it does need to be led by wheat. And so fingers crossed that we can see something build off of this momentum. I guess I'll ask you in corn in a minute, but can wheat pull others along for the ride? Oh, yeah. Wheat's like that annoying friend that just likes to take everyone either up or down with them. And so I do think that it can be the leader, but it can also be the thorn in, in corn side. And I think that's what we've seen uh, leading up to this report last Thursday is that wheat was consistently just not able to follow through on a rally. And it just it seemed like it was pulling corn down with it when it started to flip to red. As you look at wheat moving ahead, uh, do you have a range that you like? You know, for the most part, I'd just like to see actual chart action that you can actually put some extensions off of it. As of now, you have you really have not opened up any topside, so I don't want to get too excited about it, but it would be nice to see some follow through next week, and then you'll start to generate some price points to the topside that you can say, hey, I'm looking forward to this, or I'm looking at a 38% retracement line. We're just not quite there yet. When you look at the corn market then, as, as we look at... Again, the the annoying friend, that's what I was writing down, right? is, is with wheat. <laughs> but you look at this old crop, it still seems we're sitting on a ridiculous amount of grain on the farm. Nothing seemed to prompt the sales this week, did it? You mean like almost a billion bushel more corn yeah. on hand than a year ago? Yeah. That type of thing? Yeah, there's a lot of corn around. So you did get friendly numbers. So when you talk about the numbers, right, acre number, no doubt, out of the bottom end of the range of expectations. We used the most corn in this first uh, quarter of period from DEEZ to the end of Feb. Um, we used the most corn on record here. And so that is a, a favorable aspect. And I think that was probably one of those things that you took home over the weekend and then came into the week. And then all of a sudden you're talking about, you know, uh, bird flu and maybe feed feed usage and I feel like that feed usage what was what gave us the great usage in the first chunk and now we're saying could that decrease so I think there was that aspect that took it away but overall when you look at corn um, you know to be able to see it make some price points I think it can get there the problem is they're really shrunk up to see those price points you're talking like 454 for May corn and you're right there's a lot of grain in farmers hand 24 poor, I think it's 24 percent more year over year the night thing is that you actually saw uh, the end users, the elevators, the off-farm storage decrease year over year. And so that's telling me that, you know, the, the grain is getting there. It's getting used and getting out that hopefully on the cash side of things, basis might remain strong. And that's what we've seen lately is that there has been a basis push for corn. As we look at December, uh, there, the acreage number, there's a little bit of, it seemed like Monday, Tuesday had a, no, really, what's going to happen? People weren't believing some of the numbers. But we also didn't have a good early, that, that temptation to plant before the insurance deadline here in parts of the Midwest. So when you look at that deferred crop right now, do you think anybody's changed their mind since last Thursday? I don't believe that number. But the good thing is uh, we have that number to trade off of until June, right? Yeah. So it's that same situation. Like it, You might not believe it, but that is the number we're going to use. That's the number they're going to use in the May report, which is also great that we're going to be using those lower acres. The thing is you did have a lot of people talking about starting early, and this pushed it off. I didn't see anyone rolling any field work on my way down this morning. And so you did see that pushed off. But the fact is we're dry in so many areas that I don't think it matters. I 
think you're looking at an extended forecast for the next two weeks that looks hot and dry for a lot of areas. And to be honest, we got a lot of moisture over this last little bit and I don't have anyone telling me that they're wet. And so that is problematic to me that you're still going to be able to get an aggressive early start for planting. Well, that's 24. Let's talk 25 real quick. We had a question. Uh, Jeff in North Dakota wanted to know, should we be considering any December 25 corn sales at some point? Yeah, I love this question. I think it's a great one. I am a big believer in, in looking at 25 corn and saying, hey, we're really hovering around this area. We found support at 480. If we get to $5, I do think it should be done. Um, even right now, if somebody wanted to make some sales, I have no problem with it. Also, if you look, the time frame to get us out to 25, it gives us a lot of option volatility, which ends up giving some good accumulators. So if that's your jam to go to the elevator or an outside source and be doing an accumulator through the elevator, you're getting a lot of premium on top of that 25. So I really like going out there and getting a start on it. Can you smile talking about soybeans? <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I could sleep, um, but you know, it is a little bit when you look at soybeans, they're just not getting anywhere. It seems like both May and November want to get up to $12 and then they fade back off and they get back up there and it's just, we cannot break through there. If we break through there, there's some gaps about 40 cents higher that I do think we'll be able to get. So I think the writing's on the wall. I also look at soybeans as saying, hey, they're in sleeper mode. You typically say, hey, corn didn't get the acres. So you automatically think bean got the acres. We didn't see that. We saw that there just was a lack of acres. And so if we come in here and we have kind of a slower start or you look at it and also the extended forecast, and I'm talking not two weeks out, I'm talking the summer forecast, looks like a not so ideal situation for soybeans. It looks to get really hot and dry in that key time frame for beans. So I think beans could be that sleeper mode. Do you also think sleeper for the deferred, the November contract too? Yeah, that's mostly what I'm mostly talking what about. You're yep, to. just okay. because. So does demand call. come into this factor at all? I mean, we kind of alluded to it in the open, talking about China's fuzziness. We don't really know yep. what they, what their intentions are for a right. lot of countries. Yeah, so if we look back and we talk about like how disastrous it was during the trade war era, that's where we're at right now for exports. So a lot of people aren't talking about that. We know that exports are down, but they're that low. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if you can look at it and say exports were this level during the trade war and we were able to do it, I think you're looking at it and saying we should be able to keep a decent amount. This should be the bottom end of the range for exports. The nice thing is moving forward, we continue to hear these favorable stories about crush, about the the want for renewable diesel, the desire, the plants coming up. And we're not going to see these plants come up and just run half capacity. They're gonna get going when they wanna go. Livestock, I have to move to uh, because that was a dramatic pullback yes. in live cattle and in feeders. Is that all tied to this, this flu? Not necessarily. I think the writing was on the wall when you looked at it. Um, weights are really heavy right now in cattle. So I think that was starting to creep and get talked about a little bit more that you're, we obviously know the supply story is tight, the inventory is tight, but all of a sudden our weights are over 20 pounds more year over year and five pounds more than they were a month ago. And you're like, what is going on here? So I think that was the tip. And then we got this story and it really just brought the sellers. We have to remember where managed money is as well. So I think they were bailing on the contracts. But did hogs benefit though? Yeah, I think you're looking at consumer sentiment. Whether or not you agree with everything that's happening with the flu, whether or not we know that, you know, consumption, it's not going to affect consumption. But when you're hearing that story on the nightly news, some people are going to be like, mm, I'm out. I'm not going to be buying that product for a while. We have not heard about anything for our pork. And so the general sentiment is that you could see the demand shift somewhat from beef consumption to pork consumption coming into grilling season. And I think that's helping the pork market. And I, we don't necessarily discuss poultry on a regular basis here, but that also, there has to be concern in poultry states too. Oh yeah, and so you're all looking at it and you're saying which one hasn't brought up to the subject, which one hasn't been brought into uh, the, the bird flu story, and that is pork. So I think you're looking at it, not only at the switch from beef to pork, but also the switch from chicken and poultry over to pork as well. All right, uh, lump them all together corn or uh, livestock and, and do you see this as a temporary thing? Is this a pause and we're gonna go back higher? And I guess I asked the, same, the reverse for hogs. Yeah, so on the cattle market, I think actually you could be looking at something that ends up being friendly, right? Eventually this story works its way through. We stop talking about it on the nightly news, we stop seeing the headlines, people are gonna stop selling it. And then 
you look at it and we're still at tight inventory. The cash trade has softened, but it's still favorable. So I think that eventually you are going to be able to build out of this. We are just at the first price count to the downside for lives. Feeder is a little bit past that, but when you look at hog. And I'll have to get your hog take in Market Plus. Sorry, <laughs> I shouldn't have asked five questions. Right. Thanks, Christy. Good to see you. Christy Von on Cheeseth, appreciate your time. And we are going to pause the analysis and continue our discussion about these markets in our Market Plus segment. You can find both analysis and plus on our website of markettomarket.org. Instagram season is kicking into gear as Plant24 gets ready to roll. We will post some of our own images and share your best work on our feed of Market to Market show. Follow along today. Next week, growing resistance in pet antibiotics. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's next doesn't happen by chance. It happens when researchers and farmers work together to solve tomorrow's agronomic challenges. We're committed to creating what's next. Because a pioneer, our name is our mission. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.